she was a sweet Christian girl. She'd been homeschooled in her early childhood and she loved the Lord. She wanted to serve Him. Now she was entering the age where college seemed like the next step. And so she decided on a college and it was a one in her community, a uh, community college, not a Christian college. And as she was talking to me on that Sabbath afternoon, she told me that she didn't see really any difference between the community college and uh, the Christian college. And so she decided to go with the, the one that was closer to her. And her parents didn't seem concerned. They had raised her right. They had instilled within her principles to guide her in life. She was a good girl. She loved God. She wanted to serve Him. And so college was the next step, wasn't it? A few years later, our paths crossed again. But things were very different than before. That sweet Christian girl was now the woman of compromise. Everything was changed from her dress and her deportment to her very understanding of God. This scenario, it's not uncommon. I've seen it time and time again. Those who are raised in good Christian homes with an apparent focus in life, where they're going, what they want to do, they enter a college and within a few years, they lose direction. They lose their experience. They go from the sweet child to the compromising, skeptical adult. The years that parents have poured into their education and their training are wasted. And they're torn away. We're told it is a terrible fact and one that should make the hearts of parents tremble that in so many schools and colleges to which the youth are sent for mental culture and discipline influences prevail which sorry in, uh, influences prevail which misshape the character divert the mind from life's true aims and debase the morals through contact with the irreligious, the pleasure-loving, and the corrupt, many, many youth lose the simplicity and purity, the faith in God, and the spirit of self-sacrifice that Christian fathers and mothers have cherished and guarded by careful instruction and earnest prayer. So here it establishes the fact that so many of our youth go into these colleges and schools and their characters, they ha they're surrounded by influences that misshape their characters, that divert the mind from tr life's true aim, and debase the morals. That sounds like a pretty serious problem. It goes on in the same reference. Many who enter school with the purpose of fitting themselves for some line of unselfish ministry become absorbed in secular studies. An ambition is aroused to win distinction in scholarship and to gain position and honor in the world. The purpose for which they entered school is lost sight of, and the life is given up to selfish and worldly pursuits. And often, Habits are formed that ruin the life both for this world and for the world to come. The education that's received in childhood sets the foundation for life. But it's the education received as the child is entering adulthood that builds the house on that foundation. In other words, from the teen years into the early 20s, you're settling into what you believe. You've probably experienced it. I know for me, 
you're ra I was raised a certain way with principles and ideas and, and standards and so forth. And as I got into my teens, I had to decide for myself, was it just what my parents thought or was it something that I believed? You're settling in to what you believe, who you are, where you're going in life. It's a time of testing and trial. Those are extremely important years. And I think that many parents don't realize that their work in these years is far from done. They think, my child's 18, or around that age, my work's done, it's time to send them off to college so they can make their way in life. But the enemy knows that these are important years. And he knows that he, he can gain the young people when they're not yet settled in really what they believe and who they are. When they're still weak in their faith that he has them. In this time of life, as the child is entering adulthood, the parent's guidance and patience and counsel is still needed. Of course, it's different than when the children are younger, but it's still there. The wisdom of the parents is still needed. So what is the purpose of college? Get a good job? get a degree, make money, intellectual training. These are common ideas that are circulating in our world. But we want to know, what does God say? What does God say about furthering our education? In our presentation yesterday, we talked about true education. And we used a verse. Do you remember what that verse is? found in John. John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. The students should receive at college such training as will enable them to maintain a respectable, honest, virtuous standing in society against the demoralizing influences which are corrupting the youth. So part of the purpose of college training is to enable us to live respectable, honest, virtuous lives. To be in society useful human beings. Not those who are going to take advantage of people. Not those who are going to um, be puffed up and proud with all the knowledge we have, but who are truly going to help society and to stand against the demoralizing influences. That's part of the purpose of college. But how many colleges today are infusing within their students these principles? Are they really helping them to stand up against the demoralizing influences of the day? If the influence in our college is what it should be, the youth who are educated there will be enabled to discern God and glorify Him in all His work. And while engaged in cultivating the faculties which God has given them, they will be preparing to render Him more efficient service. So once again, God's purpose in setting up colleges was to prepare us to fill life's purpose, which is what? To glorify Him and bring souls into His kingdom. It was they set up colleges so that we would be able to engage in cultivating our faculties so that we can render to God more efficient and effective service. We learned yesterday that all true training is going to fit us for life's purpose. to glorify God and win souls for his kingdom. True education is missionary training. 
Every son and daughter of God is called to be a missionary. We are called to the service of God and our fellow men, and to fit us for this service should be the object of our education. So however we decide to pursue education, pursue learning, it should be with life's purpose in view. How is this learning going to fit me to serve God as a true missionary? If our training, if our education is not going to aid us in this purpose, then we learned yesterday it's faulty. It's actually more harmful than good. This object should be kept in view by Christian parents and teachers. We know not in what line our children may serve. They may, be, they may spend their lives within the circle of the home, they may engage in life's common vocations or go as teachers of the gospel to heathen lands. But all are alike called to be missionaries for God, ministers of mercy to the world. So there's different occupations in life, right? There's mechanics, there's carpentry, there's sewing, tailoring, um, there's cooking, running a restaurant. There's many different occupations in life. There's even running a home being a parent, being a mother, being a father. Um, there's those who are called to be missionaries to other countries. All of these vocations, all of these occupations are worthy of pursuit. And God may call your children into one of these lines or something else, such as publishing or what have you. But whatever it is, whatever occupation God calls your child to, it should be with life's purpose in view to bring souls into his kingdom, to be missionaries for God. With us as parents and as Christians, it rests to give our children right direction. They are to be carefully, wisely, tenderly guided into paths of Christ-like ministry. We are under sacred covenant with God to rear our children for his service. So, it rests with parents to do what? To train their children to impress upon them that they're not here in this life to make a lot of money, to get a good job, to buy everything that you want, to make a name for yourself. That's not the purpose of life. Our purpose is Christ-like ministry. And yes, that might involve being a carpenter or mechanic or, or what have you. But it's always, how am I going to use this to bring souls into God's kingdom? We are under sacred covenant with God to rear our children for His service. To surround them with such influences as shall lead them to choose a life of service. And to give them the training needed is our first duty. So... The influences around the worst allowing our children to be surrounded with should be influences that will encourage them, inspire them to serve God, to give their lives to His service in whatever occupation they're called to. And it's our sacred duty, our first duty, to surround them with such influences. The highest of all sciences is the science of soul saving. You mean it's not of intellectual training? No, it's a soul saving. The greatest work to which human beings can aspire is the work of winning men from sin to holiness. For the accomplishment of this work, a broad foundation must be laid. A comprehensive education is needed, an education that will demand from parents and teachers such thought and effort as mere instruction in the sciences does not require. So, it says that yes, we need training. Yes, we need to learn how to fulfill life's purpose. We need to have cultivated minds. But instruction in the sciences is not sufficient to give us that education that we need. Something more is called for than the culture of the intellect. Education is not complete unless the body, the mind, and the heart are equally educated. We've already talked about this, the physical, the mental, and the spiritual training. So that your 
these things in education you're developing within your child in those early years, the physical, the mental, and the spiritual, you're uniting them in one, and you don't, you don't finish that when they enter those college years or they're starting to go into adulthood. You don't just say, okay, you've had this great early upbringing where we've developed your mental, your physical, and your spiritual. Now, go, just study from books. No, that's not the purpose of true education. Education is not complete unless the body, the mind, and the heart are equally educated. The character must receive proper discipline for its fullest and highest development. All the faculties of mind and body are to be developed and rightly trained. It is a duty to cultivate and to exercise every power that will render us more efficient workers for God. True education includes the whole being. It teaches the right use of oneself. It enables us to make the best use of brain, bone, and muscle, of body, mind, and heart. The faculties of the mind as the higher powers are to rule the kingdom of the body. The natural aptitudes and passions are to be brought under the control of the conscience and the spiritual affections. Christ stands at the head of humanity, and it is his purpose to lead us in his service into high and holy paths of purity. By the wondrous working of his grace, we are, ma we are to be made complete in him. Where did Jesus receive his education? In the home, right? Jesus, he was the great physician, the mighty counselor, the master designer, the great interpreter, the ruler, the judge. Yet he received his education in the home. His mother was his first human teacher. From her lips and from the scrolls of the prophets, he learned of heavenly things. He lived in a peasant's home and faithfully and cheerfully acted his part in bearing the household burdens. He who had been, been the commander of heaven was a willing servant, a loving, obedient son. He learned a trade and with his own hands worked in the carpenter's shop with Joseph. In the garb of a common laborer, he walked the streets of the little town, going to and returning from his humble work. So Christ first learned from his mother and he did learn a trade. He did learn an occupation at the hand of his father and that he used as part of his, his missionary work. His life demonstrated the worthlessness of those things that men regarded as life's great essentials. The schools of his time with their magnifying of things small and their belittling of things great, he did not seek. How many of our schools magnify things small and belittle things great? Jesus didn't seek that type of an education. His education was gained from heaven-appointed sources, from useful work, from the study of the scriptures, from nature, and from the experiences of life. God's lesson books full of instruction to all who bring to them the willing hand, the seeing eye, and the understanding heart. As we see God's plan of education, the only way we're gonna be able to fulfill it, the only way we're gonna embrace it and let it trans just transform our lives and the lives of our children is if we are willing. If we're willing. Sometimes we don't understand how it's possible. Where is God going to take us? How are we going to get to where we need to get? But if we're willing, He will lead us. This is our example, and this was His education. He did not seek the schools of his day. Yet, the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Thus prepared, he went forth to his mission in every moment of his contact with men exerting upon them an influence to bless, a power to transform, such as the world had never witnessed. Do you want your children to be like that? Do you want them to have such a power in this life that the world takes knowledge of them? It's a high calling, but it's possible. 
think about college life for a moment. I have a good friend who has her degree in nutrition and she was talking to me one day and just sharing some of her experience, not uh, thinking too much that I would possibly use her story in a presentation someday. She was just sharing things she had learned in her life and she said that in her course of study, she had to learn a great deal of information in a short amount of time. There was a lot of cramming involved and she would spend long hours studying for tests and, and she would go into the classroom and she would take the test, she would walk out of the classroom and what do you think she did? She said there was a trash can right near the door and it was as if all the information she had just crammed in her mind she threw away because she had to make room for the next test. And she went through her, her schooling in this way. Of course she learned some things, but most of the things that she learned she forgot or couldn't use. And I thought, how practical is that? How is that fitting one for service? Let the youth advance as fast and as far as they can in the acquisition of knowledge. Let their field of study be as broad as their powers can compass. And as they learn, let them impart their knowledge. It is thus that their minds will acquire discipline and power. It is the use they make of knowledge that determines the value of their education. You know, if my friend would have studied and then shared what she learned, if she had that opportunity, um, which was rather impossible in her type of education because of the cramming system, it would have benefited her, it would have profited others. But because she didn't have that time to share what she was learning, she lost it. And the value of her training was very low. It goes on and it says, to spend a long time in study with no effort to impart what is gained often proves a hindrance rather than a help to real development. In both the home and the school, it should be the student's effort to learn how to study and how to impart the knowledge gained. Whatever his calling, he is to be both a learner and a teacher as long as life shall last. Thus he may advance continually, making God his trust, clinging to him who is infinite in wisdom, who can reveal the secrets hidden for ages, who can solve the most difficult problems for minds that believe in him. There's so much to learn, but we serve a God who has infinite knowledge, who will help us unlock the mysteries of ages. But he wants to do it in a different way than the world does it. And as he shows us how, it'll really benefit us in fulfilling life's purpose. Many people spend years in acquiring an education, so-called, and then finally they get to use it but they've wasted so much of their time being useful. I think of my experience. I started learning the publishing work when I was um, about 13, 14. I studied books. I got a computer for Christmas or my birthday, some holiday, and I learned uh, how to use the word processing programs I contacted different ministries and asked them what they used in their publishing work. And then I bought that same program and I studied the manual and then I took a cookbook, I took several cookbooks and looked at the layout and the format of it and then tried to reproduce it on the computer. And I learned that program. And for the last 15 years I've been involved with publishing in ministry. I've been able to use my knowledge and gain more knowledge as I've done on the job training instead of just spending years studying it and not applying it to serve God. People would encourage me, you know, why don't you go and, and go to college and get a degree in graphic design or something. 
I never felt God was leading me in that area because I was already working and serving Him. And there was such a need. There's such a need for missionaries, for workers in so many fields. The needs are great. But are we willing to let God teach us to apply ourselves so that we can be in service right now doing what He calls us to do? It's a different work. It's a different type of training than most are familiar with. And the world does not look at such training as of much value until they see the fruits. But of his disciples, Christ said, I have given them thy word, and they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. John 17, 14. Romans 12, 2 says, Be not conformed to this world, God bids us, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. True education takes an unlearning of the world system and a relearning of God's system. It's a transformation, a renewing of the mind. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? You know, so many of the degrees and certificates are really idols. Not to everyone, but I've met some who, when they show you their title, it's an idol to them. The verse continues, For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord. Gather the children. Make them know the statutes of God and his laws. Put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. And all the peoples of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of Jehovah. Do you want people to know that you are called by the name of Jehovah? And receive his training. Undertake his plan of education. John the Baptist got his education when he went into the desert and into the wilderness. The priests and rulers were so troubled and distressed because John did not walk according to the old regular order in getting his education. Yet Jesus said there was not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. You know, in, today, in today's world we tend to think that college is the only step. But there's so many other options for preparing you for ministry. One of those options is an apprenticeship type program. And that's basically on the job training. Let's say you're interested in carpentry. So you find someone who is a good carpenter who can build things and you ask if you can learn with them, if they will teach you what they know. And they take you under their wing and they just, they teach you everything. Remember that story that I told the other day about the, the lady who had a 10th grade education and she went to Africa and she worked with a, a doctor and he taught her everything that he knew. And she ran a clinic and she ended up managing doctors and nurses from the knowledge that she received in her apprenticeship type program with that doctor and also the education that God gave her himself. When I was about 16, I decided to start thinking about furthering my education, what I was gonna do in the coming years, how I was gonna pursue ministry. I had an interest in publishing, but I didn't know how I was going to continue learning where God was going to take me. And when I was 16, um, we moved onto a college campus and my mother worked in one of the departments. 
so I got to observe college life for a whole year. It was a Christian college, uh, very conservative, but as I observed some of the students and teachers and different classes and their type of education, I decided that that wasn't for me, that, that that wasn't what God had for me to do, that He was going to train me in another way, a different way, somewhere where I could learn personally what He was calling me to do, which I believed was in the publishing work. I didn't know where that was going to happen or, or how it was going to happen, but I knew that the promise in Philippians 4.19 would be fulfilled. And that says, my God shall supply most of your needs, no, all your need, according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I had a, des a desire to serve God, to be in ministry. And I knew that God would fulfill that desire and give me training. There was a prayer that was written in the 1800s and it became very personal to me. It said, my father, be thou the guide of my youth. So simple, yet so profound. God has to be our guide as we seek training, as we seek to fulfill the purpose of life. So during my teens, people would encourage me to go go into a college and get a, a degree in graphic design. You, I'm sure you could learn a lot and I just didn't feel that that was right for me. And at the age of 17, the Lord directed us through a series of providential events to Sunlight Education Ministry. And for the next three years, I entered what we eventually called an apprenticeship type program. It was on the job training. I was placed right in the office uh, in the care of the director. She would give me an assignment, uh, whether it be writing or proofreading or typesetting. And I was working, I was doing ministry, but I was also learning. And for the next three years, that's what I did. I learned so many things there, not only um, how to develop or improve my writing skills, but also um, other aspects of the publishing work, such as printing and so forth, graphic design, song leading, and how to improve the voice, and teaching, teaching all ages, and recording and producing music. We had our own recording studio, and I got to be um, involved with that very extensively. While I was learning, I was serving God. I wasn't just studying a book, but I was able to serve Him and help others come closer to Him. And I really am so thankful now as I look back that God led me into an, an apprenticeship type program because I know that I learned so much more than I could have in just a college setting. I know that if you focus on what God wants you to do, what He wants you to learn, He will bring those into your life to help with that training. We do not say that you should go nowhere or anywhere to get an education, but we do say that every man is not dependent upon a school or college education to do work for the Master. If he is converted to God, soul, body, and spirit, he is in connection with the great teacher, the greatest missionary that the world ever knew. We are to feel no sufficiency in ourselves, for the Lord God of heaven is our wisdom, our sanctification, our strength, and our righteousness. If we realize our dependence and hang our helpless souls on Jesus, we shall find that the waters of life will flow into the soul, and it will be, as Christ said to the Samaritan woman, a well of water springing up, into everlasting life. We're not telling you what you need to do. You have to find out from God what you need to do. But remember that God is the greatest teacher. This next quotation is very powerful. So I hope that you will pay attention because it talks very strongly about pursuing an education and things to consider. First it says, none should be allowed to pursue a course of study that may in any way weaken their faith in the truth 
and in the Lord's power or diminish their respect for a life of holiness. That's pretty powerful. None should be allowed to pursue a course of study that will in any way weaken your faith. It doesn't stop there, though. It goes on. I would warn the students not to advance one step in these lines. In what lines? In the lines of taking a course of study that will weaken your faith. I That may weaken your faith. I would warn the students not to advance in one step in these lines, not even upon the advice of their instructors or men in positions of authority. So don't head down that path of pursuing training if it has the possibility to weaken your faith, even if those you respect are encouraging you in that direction. Unless they have first, so unless you have first sought God individually, with their hearts thrown open to the influence of the Holy Spirit and obtained his counsel concerning the completed course of study. Let every selfish desire to distinguish yourself be set aside. Take every suggestion from humanity to God, trusting in the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Every unholy ambition should be blotted out. You know, many times when we say that we're going to go to college or we have that longing, that desire, it's influenced by ambition unholy ambition it's influenced by a desire to distinguish ourselves and we're told that none should be allowed to enter a course of study that may in any way weaken your faith unless you are certain that God is leading you and will carry you through that course of study unscathed by the world. Search your heart. Make sure you know what is directing you in that path. We want a balanced perspective when we talk about education, especially when we talk about college. We know that there are references in the spirit of prophecy that actually encourage people to attend college, who give examples of those who have been sent into the schools of the day. And so we want to look at those references and see what they're talking about. This next reference is giving some history about the Waldenses. The Waldenses were a group of people long time ago who for centuries held the Word of God as their standard. They kept the Sabbath. They kept the truths, the Bible, um, in its purity. And they were a holy, sanctified people. Their children were trained aright. They were educated in their mountain homes. And they were educated for ministry, to be missionaries. They were greatly persecuted during this time and they had to be very careful how they shared the truth. But this says that the Waldenses did enter the schools of the world as students. They made no pretensions. Apparently they paid no attention to anyone, but they lived out what they believed. They never sacrificed principle and their principles soon became known. That was a key. Their principles soon became known. This was different from anything the other students had seen. And they began to ask themselves, what does this all mean? Why cannot these men be induced to swerve from their principles? While they were considering this, they heard them praying in their rooms, not to the Virgin Mary, but to the Savior, whom they addressed as the only mediator between God and man. The worldly students were encouraged to make inquiries, and as the simple story of the truth, as it is in Jesus, was told, their minds grasped it. Those who have the Spirit of God, who have the truth wrought into their very being, should be encouraged to enter colleges and live the truth. As what? As Daniel and Paul did. Each one should study to see what is the best way to get the truth into the school that the light may shine forth. Daniel was taken to Babylon as a slave, and he was educated in Babylon, but he had a purpose. 
While he was there, his purpose was to bring souls into the kingdom. The Waldenses had a purpose in going to the colleges of their day, and that was to influence them for God, to take the truth and permeate that institution with the truth. Remember the previous quote, it said, they made no pretensions, but they lived out what they believed. They paid apparently no attention to people. The, another quote we're going to read says that they didn't make friends. They kept to themselves because they had a purpose. And that was to share the truth. It wasn't to simply gain intellectual culture, but it was to have a holy influence on that institution. So those who have the Spirit of God should be encouraged to enter schools for what purpose? To bring souls into the kingdom. But let's continue. Let them show that they have respect, that they respect all the rules and regulations of the school. The leaven will begin to work for we can depend upon, for we can depend much more upon the power of God manifested in the lives of his children than upon any words that can be spoken. But they should also tell inquirers in as simple language as they can of the simple Bible doctrines. Let's keep reading. Those there are those who, after becoming established, rooted and grounded in the truth, should enter these institutions of learning as students. They can keep the living principles of the truth and observe the Sabbath, and yet they will have opportunity to work for the Master by dropping seeds of truth in minds and hearts. Under the influence of the Holy Spirit, these, su these seeds will spring up to bear fruit for the glory of God and will result in the saving of souls. The students need not go to these institutions of learning in order to become enlightened upon theological subjects. So they're not going to get trained upon these subjects, for the teachers of the school need themselves to become Bible students. No open controversies should be started, yet opportunity will be given to ask questions upon Bible doctrines, and light will be flashed into many minds. A spirit of investigation will be aroused. but. So when we have the word but, we know that something else is coming, right? So, yes, it would be good to go into the colleges to have an influence, but I scarcely dare present this method of labor. Why? For there is danger that those who have no connection with God will place themselves in these schools, and instead of correcting error and diffusing light, will themselves be led astray. But this work must be done, and it will be done by those who are led and taught of God. Yes, there are those who need to go into our colleges, colleges of the world, for the purpose of spreading light, for the purpose of being missionaries, not to simply gain uh, learning and, and cultivating their intellect and gaining knowledge, for the purpose of being missionaries to reach souls for his kingdom. But... It's a dangerous work. And many times we think we're stronger than we are. We think our connection is deep. And we go into the colleges and more harm than good is wrought. There's a reference that's not on our screen, but I want to bring your attention to it. It's from the book Medical Ministry, page 62. I have not a word to say in favor of the world's ideas of higher education in any school that, will, that we shall organize for the training of physicians. There is danger in their attaching themselves to worldly institutions and working under the ministrations of worldly physicians. Satan is giving his orders to those whom he has led to depart from the faith. I would now advise that none of our young people attach themselves to worldly medical institutions in the hope of gaining better success or stronger influence as physicians. We have so much counsel about these subjects. We want to hear it all so that we can make a solid, honoring, God-honoring decision in pursuing training. 
of the Waldenses, we are told that they were sent to the colleges to be missionaries, but not all were sent, only the strongest, only a select few who had been tested and proved, who could bear the dangers. It was not to make money, it was not to make a name for themselves, it was not to gain intellectual culture, but it was to win souls for the kingdom of God. And going into the colleges was a dangerous and lonely task. They didn't have friends. They were to share their hearts with none. They were to be on guard at all times for the wrong, one wrong word or one word that was at the wrong moment in the wrong ears could be used against them and hinder their work. They were to watch for opportunities to share truth at the risk of their very lives. Some today may be called to enter college, but it will be a very difficult and dangerous work. It will be a work that the only way you're going to get through is with life's purpose in view, to win souls for the kingdom of God and to bring glory to his name. It was God's purpose that his church would set up colleges for the training of his people. And that they would rightly train the youth and fit them for service. If we do not have schools for our youth, they will attend other se seminaries and colleges and will be exposed to infidel sentiments, to cavillings and questionings concerning the inspiration of the Bible. There is a great deal of talk concerning higher education. And many suppose that higher education consists wholly in an education in science and literature. But this is not all. The highest education includes the knowledge of the Word of God and is comprehended in the words that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. The highest class of education is that which will give such knowledge and discipline as will lead to the best development of character and will fit the soul for that life which measures with the life of God. That's the highest class of education that will fit us for service, that will fit us for missionary service, that will develop our characters and that will help our lives measure with the life of God. Eternity is not to be lost out of our reckoning. So we're not to pursue training without keeping eternity in view. How is this training going to affect me for eternity? The highest education is that which will teach our children and youth the science of Christianity, which will give them an experimental knowledge of God's ways and will impart to them the lessons that Christ gave to his disciples of the paternal character of God. Our children may never enter college, but they can obtain an education in those essential branches which, will, which they can turn to a practical use and which will give culture to the mind and bring its powers into use. Very many youth who have gone through a college course have not obtained that true education that can be put to practical use. They may have the name of having a collegiate education, but in reality, they are only educated dunces. Does this mean that we should not seek to cultivate our intellect? Absolutely not. We need to be professionals in our field. We need to be professional in what we do. We need to cultivate the intellect. We're told cultivated intellect is now needed in the cause of God for novices cannot do the work acceptably. We need to know what we're doing and how to do it. But where are we receiving that education and at what expense? Is our eternal life at stake? Or are we able to keep our focus in what our mission is? However, 
as we know that cultivating our intellect is important that novices are not going to be able to do the work that we need to learn something we need to know what we're doing we're told in choosing men and women for his service God does not ask whether they possess worldly wealth learning or eloquence he asks do they walk in such humility that I can teach them my way? When Jesus called the disciples, he called uneducated men, uneducated in the world standards, because he could use them, because they were humble and teachable, because they were willing to learn. God asks, can I put my words into their lips? Do we think that we know so much that after we receive training that we know enough that we can speak? Moses, when he was educated in Egypt, thought he could speak. He could deliver God's people. God said, you're not ready. He took him to the wilderness and had to retrain him for 40 years. That's a long education. 40 years and then he said okay Moses are you ready Moses said I can't even speak God said okay you're ready now because I know that you are gonna walk in humility before me you have received true education and now I can put my words in your lips God asks Will they represent me? God can use every person just in proportion as he can put his spirit into the soul temple. The work that he will accept is the work that reflects his image. His followers are to bear as their credentials to the world the ineffaceable characteristics of his immortal principles. That's the kind of credential we want. I don't know where God's going to lead you and your children in your education, in obtaining more knowledge for service. But seek him with your whole heart and he will guide you. And at every step, continue to seek him. Walk in humility before him with the purpose of bearing his image and glorifying his name. And he will be honored in your life. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have given us such instruction, such pointed instruction. We don't have to question. You will direct us. You promised to be our teacher. And I pray for each one here as they seek to train their children that you will guide them, that you will give them holy ambitions, that you will help them to be focused and to not lose their way in whatever learning they seek. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Um.